Well, good morning. Let's all stand together as we affirm our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, do you, uh, uh, can you remember the initial days of COVID? What was that, three years ago now or going on for? I, I, I forget. Uh, for some, it's just a, a distant memory. But do you remember when it started to, uh, to do its thing and nobody really knew what, what it was? And we really didn't know in those initial days you know, how infectious that it was, and there was all of these things that we did to isolate from, from one another. I, I remember going to a gas station, and uh, I, I had in those, just in the early days, those, I had those plastic or gloves, you know, in the pocket of my car, and so then I would uh, go to the gas station, and, and you'd put on the gloves, right, so in case somebody else had touched the, the gas handle. Did anybody else do this? Okay, yeah. So, so I, I can remember one time distinctly um, going there, putting my gloves on, you know, pulling the gas thing out, filling up my car. And, uh, uh, and before that, I had to put my credit card in, you know, and so I had to take my wallet out. But I was, wait a minute, I've already touched that with my gloves. And so I touched my wallet, and then I pull out my, my credit card. What, what, do I, what do I do now? And, and I just said, forget it. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't stop, I couldn't not touch things that I already had touched. Anybody else have that experience? You know, where do you go with that? And, and we, didn't, we didn't know in that first time just how infectious that thing was. Sin is worse. Sin is worse. But we don't think about it. Sin is worse. Look what J.I. Packer says. Sin, it is lawlessness in relation to God as lawgiver, rebellion in relation to God as rightful ruler, missing the mark in relation to God as our designer, guilt in relation to God as judge, uncleanness in relation to God as the holy one. Sin is a perversity touching each one of us at every point in our lives. And I love what Augustine said. My sin was that I looked for pleasure, beauty, and truth, not in God, but in myself and in other creatures. And that search led me instead to pain, confusion, and error. Or maybe as that great theologian, Johnny Lee, sang so many years ago, looking for love in all the wrong places. We're trying to find something to fulfill this need that we know that we have. We have it, an itch that we have to scratch, and sin is when we look someplace else other than our God. Adam and Eve got the problem started, didn't they? You know, uh, somebody could say that the first problem was that Adam listened to Eve, but I'm not going to go there, okay? Yeah, they, they both diverted their attention. The short story is Adam and Eve, they thought they knew better. Even though they knew clearly what God had said, they thought that they had a better idea. And so they followed their own inclinations instead of what God had said. They did not believe that God had their best interests at heart. The deceiver said, oh, you'll know better. And so they took their eyes off from what God God said, they moved their ears and they did not listen to what God had said. Instead, they put them on themselves, on their own reasoning, and it had disastrous consequences that continue to this day. They thought that something out there 
was better than God's plan. I don't think there's a single person in this room who has not had a plan and it's gone south. It's the nature of what we fight with. And sometimes we have a tendency, oftentimes we have a tendency to be diverted and our attention is turned and we think we have a better idea for our life than God does. Look what James says in James 1. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Now here it is. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their, what's it say? Own evil desire and what? See, one of the things that we don't realize is, and we don't talk about, is sin is fun. Amen? Sin is fun for a while. There are kicks, and then there are what? Kickbacks. There are consequences. Each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is grown, gives birth to death. Now, uh, first this morning, I want us to look at just some simple, simple truths. First, all have sinned. All have sinned. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, I did extensive research on that word all, and you know what it means? All. all. <laughs> it means everybody. It means whether you are, are, are not a follower of Jesus yet or whether you have been a follower of Jesus for decades and decades and decades. It means that sin is a reality for us. The second truth we have to understand is that God hates it. God hates it. It's not a case of just a minor little disdain or, you know, a momentary inconvenience. God hates sin. He hates sin. The things that you and I minimize. Now, there's an important distinction that we have to make, and sometimes we, we blur the lines on this one. It's easy to make the leap to think that, start believing that God hates the sinner. Nothing could be farther from the truth. God hates, uh, God, God loves the sinner. God loves the people who sin. God loves it, but he hates the things that we do. He hates our sin. Now, why does God hate sin so much? Very simply, because of the pain it causes. God hates sin because of the damage, because of the suffering that it brings into our lives. God, in his deep, deep love for each and every one of us, doesn't want to see us in pain. He doesn't want to see us suffer. And so when sin is part of the landscape, we have pain, we have suffering, we have sorrow. Do you remember a few weeks ago, some of you remember when we were talking about the wrath of God, and I explained how if someone injured our new uh, baby granddaughter and did that on purpose, that my wrath towards that person would be an expression of my love for her. Do you remember that? So, so the reality, the reason that God hates sin so much is because it hurts the kids that he loves. God's wrath is expressed against sin, and God hates sin because it hurts his kids. And you see, with sin, there is always, say that word, always. always. There is always collateral damage. Always. Some of you have been hit by sin's shrapnel. Always. Our actions impact one another in ways that we cannot fathom. We do not know. You know, there's that whole thing of six degrees of separation across the world, right? Well, you know, in western Pennsylvania, it's about three and a half. <laughs> you know, everything we do impacts other people around us. God loves us so much he died for us. He gave his life so we could live, and that shows how precious we are to him. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. <clears throat> Do you remember a few years ago, we had that whole series of storms come through western Pennsylvania, and there were a lot of people's roofs damaged. Do you remember that? 
maybe your home was one of the ones where, where your roof was damaged. Uh, we were blessed, and, and our, the roof on our house was, was okay. But I had several people pull into my driveway wanting to give me estimates to fix my roof, right? You tracking with me? And so I remember this one guy, <clears throat> nothing against Texas, but he had a Texas plate on his truck. He pulled in, and he said, uh, uh, you know, I, I see you have some damage on your roof. And I said, well, there's nothing wrong with my roof. He said, well, uh, if you want to get a, get a new roof, we get you a new roof. And I said, no, I, I, I don't don't need one and he said well he reached behind the seat of his truck and he picked up a ball peen hammer and he said we could go up and check if there are hail dents in your roof (laughs) yeah I know of a ton of people who told me they didn't need a roof but the insurance company is going to pay for it and so they put on a new roof nobody's hurt right except all of us who are paying insurance on our home right? What we do impacts other people around us. You ever been wearing a sweater and you see a, uh, just sort of a, a thread that's hanging there loose? You said, I'm going to get that, get rid of that. And you grab the thread and what happens? It unravels. We are attached to one another in ways that we cannot fathom. And my sin affects you. Your sin affects other people constantly Romans 14 says this for none of us lives for ourselves alone and none of us die for ourselves alone so we're all sinners God hates our sin and third God is willing to forgive God is willing to forgive Hebrews 8 says for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sin no more. Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. Lord, if you kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? The answer, nobody. But with you, there is forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. Now, we understand those first three, and so I'm going to come now to the hard one. God wants us to forgive others. God wants us to forgive others. Yeah, we've heard that so much, it's almost a cliche. But so often, we retain bitterness, and we hold on to the hurts, we hold on to the baggage, we hold on to to all those feelings about past sins that have impacted us. And the truth is, many of us were, and many of us are, victims of the sins of other people. We have felt that collateral damage, and some continue to feel the collateral damage, and the wave of that damage just continues. Recently, I was talking to someone, not not in our church, not related to our church at all, and they were telling me about the incredible bitterness in their family, about how even though the kids are in their 60s, the bitterness of mom and dad continue to tear them apart because there's unresolved things in their family. They are holding on, and uh, these parents would not forgive anybody for anything, and they're holding on to resentment towards someone that the other person didn't even do it. But they won't let go of that perceived fault, and they're holding on to their bitterness. Now, we know God says we should forgive. Why? There are some very good reasons. First of all, because God has forgiven me. God has forgiven me. God has offered his forgiveness to you. Ephesians 4 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ. What's it say? God forgave you. It's good enough for you. It's good enough for the people who have hurt you. When I remember how much God has forgiven me for, it just causes me, <coughs> excuse me, to want to be more forgiving of other people. You see, the way this works in our brains is if I don't feel forgiven, then I have a harder time forgiving the people who have hurt me. Now, 
if you are the type of person who has a hard time letting go of hurt, if you are the type of person who, is, who hangs on to a grudge, the possibility is there that you really do not understand the forgiveness of God. If you're hanging on to that bitterness, you see, if I don't feel grace, I certainly don't want you to feel grace. If I don't walk in the graciousness of God, then I won't be gracious towards you. If I don't feel free of the things that I have done, if I feel like I am still on the hook, I'm going to want to keep the people on the hook who have hurt me. You see how that works? On the other hand, if I'm living in the light of grace, if I'm living knowing that he has wiped slate wiped the slate clean in Christ of all the things that the, the punishment that I deserve but in his grace he has forgiven me then it makes me a little more ready to be forgiving of the people who hurt me you see you will never have to forgive anyone for more than God has already forgiven you second why forgive? Because resentment doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's counterproductive. When you and I resent other people, it always hurts us more than it hurts them. If anybody had a right to be resentful, it was a guy named Job. Remember that book in the Bible in the Old Testament? Job was the Bill Gates of his day. All kinds of money, all kinds of everything that you could imagine. He was a godly man. He was the most wealthy, famous man of his day. Short story. Enemies came in, destroyed his crops, his livestock. He lost his livelihood. He lost his family. He got a terrible disease. He was in great pain. The only thing he had left was a nagging wife. <laughs> Go and read Job. I'm not making that up, okay? And then his friends come to him and they say, Job, it's your fault. What did you do? And he's going, I didn't do it. If anybody had a right to be resentment, resentful, it'd be Job. But it doesn't work. Job 5, verse 2. <clears throat> to worry yourself to death with resentment would be a what? Foolish, senseless thing to do. The Bible says it's foolish, it's senseless, it's irrational. In the Livermore Amplified version, it's dumb. Resentment chews us up. When you and I are so filled with hate and resentment, we do foolish and, and ridiculous things. How many of you remember the Three Stooges? I used to love the Three Stooges. Uh, you know, <coughs> there was one time when, when Mo was hitting Curly. You know, Mo was always smacking Curly. Well, Curly didn't like it. He was hitting him on the chest. And Curly said, okay, I'm going to get even. So Curly takes a stick of dynamite and he tapes it to his own chest. He says, I'm going to get even. The next time he hits me in the chest, <laughs> he'll blow his hand off. That's what resentment does. That's the kind of thing that you and I do when we try to get even with people. Job 18 verse 4 says, you are only hurting yourself with your anger. It's unhelpful. See, it always hurts you more than the other person. The friend who betrayed you, the former husband, the former wife, the parent, the teacher, the sister, the brother, all the resentment in the world will not change one thing about your past. Hanging on to all of those wrongs will never help you. It just hurts you. It may have happened six years ago, 16 years ago, or 60 years ago. And every time you think about it, it causes pain in your life. And, and, and then and you realize that the, you need to realize that the people who hurt you are probably going along on their merry way and they don't even care. And in fact, if they knew that you were still burned up with resentment, guess what they would probably feel? Oh, yeah, I got her again. I got him again. And some of the things that you and I hold on to grudges for, the person who did it to us doesn't even remember. It's unhelpful. 
It's like carrying fire in your chest. It's like swallowing poison. It's like choosing a cancer that will eat you up. Bitterness hurts you. It's unhelpful. It's unhealthy. Job 21, some men stay healthy until the day they die. Others have no happiness at all. They live and die with bitter hearts. Research has shown over and over and over again, not just by believers, not just by disciples of Jesus, but research has shown that bitterness and resentment is the most destructive emotion that you and I experience. But so often, we choose it. And when we do, we are only hurting ourselves. Maybe you've said about somebody, well, they're a real pain in the neck. Maybe they are. The tension, the bitterness just ties us up into knots. You see, it's not so much what you eat, but it's what you let eat you that tears us up inside. So why forgive? Forgive because you've been forgiven. Forgive because resentment doesn't work. And forgive because I need forgiveness too. I need forgiveness too. I needed forgiveness to get to this point, and I'm going to need forgiveness from here on out. And you can't expect people to forgive you if you're not willing to forgive them. Matthew 6 says, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your heavenly Father will not forgive your sins. Family, I love you. I didn't say that. Jesus did. You see, we cannot receive what we are unwilling to give. What you and I sow, we will reap. There was a man who came to John Wesley one day, and he said, I could never forgive that man. And John Wesley said, then I hope you never sin. You see, when you and I are unforgiving, we are burning the very bridge that we need to walk across, the bridge of forgiveness. I can't tell you the number of times I've talked to people about giving forgiveness, and they've said to me, Pastor Chris, you don't know what she did to me. Pastor Chris, you don't know how for years and years I was abused. And you and I said to them, you're right, I don't. I don't know. I cannot perceive and I cannot possibly understand some of the pain that some of you have gone through, some of the pain that you are going through. But as long as you hold on to it, you are allowing someone from your past to continue to hurt you today in the present. You see, they can't continue to hurt you unless you allow them to by not forgiving them you may say pastor chris i could never forgive that person now sometimes when people say that i think they don't understand what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not first of all forgiveness is not minimizing the seriousness of what they did to you Some people think forgiveness means, oh, just fluffing it off. Oh, it's no big deal. Yes, it was. It was a huge deal. It was a big thing. And forgiveness isn't saying it wasn't. See, there's a difference between forgiveness and acceptance. (coughs) Forgiveness is reserved for those intentional hurts, those times when, when people intentionally hurt us. Now, You have accidentally been hurt by people around you, and you have accidentally hurt those around you. Every husband and every wife knows that. And and the only way that our relationships can continue to thrive is if we recognize that those hurts come accidentally sometimes. We human beings are sort of like porcupines, you know. We get close to one another, and what do we do? Going to jab each other, you know, and so there can be pain. But forgiveness... It's when we recognize that that is there and those wounds can come and forgiveness then comes as we intentionally, intentionally forgive. 
Forgiveness is not the same thing as restoring trust. Many people think, and I have heard people say, well, you know, if she's really forgiven me, then she will trust me again. Not necessarily so. Forgiveness and trust are two very, very different things. You may make the decision to forgive in an instant. You may make that decision over and over and over again to forgive that person because sometimes we have to do that before it becomes operative in our lives, but you may never trust them again. Why? They have to prove that they're trustworthy. Some of you have been hurt in ways and your trust has been broken in such drastic ways that you probably should not trust some of the people who have hurt you. But that's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is a choice we make instantly. The Bible says that you and I are obligated to forgive, but we are not obligated to trust. We have no track record. I've talked to other pastors who a wife has come from an abusive situation and the pastor has said if she really forgived him, she would go back. No, that's not forgiveness. Forgiveness and trust are two different things. Forgiveness is not resuming the relationship without any changes. Forgiveness doesn't mean everything will be just hunky-dory the way that it always was before. Oh, it might, and it might be better. I know friends who have forgiven one another. I know couples, who, you know, husbands and wives who have, they've hurt each other very, very deeply. They've forgiven, and they have rebuilt their relationship far beyond what it ever was before. What an awesome gift forgiveness can bring. But you see, if a relationship is going to be restored, there has to be repentance, restitution, and rebuilding. It's not the same thing as forgiveness. Forgiveness is not the same thing as rebuilding the relationship. Some of you have been hurt so deeply by a loved one that the very thought of forgiving them is almost unthinkable. Forgiveness, it doesn't mean that you will never have a painful thought. Forgiveness doesn't mean that all of the memories of that will be totally, totally gone, but it does mean that you can release the bitterness and you can release the control that those past events are exerting on your life. That you then can take charge of your moods and of, uh, uh, and, and of your life. Forgiveness, to, to steal a phrase from Matt Chandler, forgiveness is releasing someone from their wrongs fully, freely, and forever. It's letting it go. You say, Pastor Chris, I can't do that. I can't either. In your own strength, in my own strength, we cannot forgive the way God has called us to forgive. You see, the only way we can do it is by remembering that the Holy Spirit lives within us. And the power to forgive does not initiate within us. It comes from the power of God living in us and through us. God forgave us and our sin killed Jesus. Now, <clears throat> God wants us to forgive other people not because they deserve it. I've heard people say, and maybe you have, I could never forgive her. She doesn't deserve it. Well, you're right. She doesn't. Neither do I. Forgiveness is offering them the grace God doesn't want us to be held down. He want, doesn't want us to be held back. He doesn't want us to carry the pain of resentment and bitterness that steals our joy and our peace. You see, the unforgiven become the unforgiving. And the unforgiving become the unforgiven. You may have to take that home and unpack it a little bit, but it is so, so very true. You see, if we don't forgive other people, it means we truly don't understand the forgiveness of God. Remember what you just prayed? Forgive us our trespasses, what? Don't miss that. So if I don't. Matt Chandler, in this week's lesson, he says, the people of God are never more authentic than when they ask for forgiveness and when they forgive others. 
He says the platform of God, the people of God becomes the platform of how God's forgiveness is shown in the world. You see, if you and I don't understand forgiveness, we we miss it. Luke 6 says, But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. You just said, I believe in the forgiveness of sin, right? Here's what holds us back from that. And I want to close our time together by looking at at two common problems that I see as a pastor. The first problem is we don't really believe that we have sinned or, or that we are sinners. We live in what some have called the seduction of the suburbs or the seclusion of the small town. We rationalize our sin and we say all kinds of things. We, uh, we overestimate our own goodness because we always compare ourselves to somebody else who we perceive is worse. And so we say then my sin is not as bad as hers. And so, yeah, I may have done that, but I didn't do what he did. And so we really don't relish the forgiveness that we have received because we are good people. We have a tendency to to minimize our own sin and we maximize the sins of others. We are great rationalizers. We all say this, you know, boys will be boys, right? Or just sowing a few wild oats or, you know, after all, I'm only human. And when we say any of those phrases, we are minimizing the sin in our own lives. And we will never understand forgiveness as long as we minimize that. You see, just because it's common doesn't mean that it's trivial. Just because everybody does it doesn't make it right. More and more, living as a Christian is countercultural. Many of the values that God teaches in his word are exactly the opposite to what our culture is teaching. And every time you and I stand for those values in the classroom, in our schools, at our places of work, in the clubs and the sports teams, we are like salmon swimming upstream all the time. The culture does not live that way. Now that's why some people see Christians as hypocrites. Because we talk about sin and forgiveness and, and we... we you know, and, and, and think that everybody else has this issue and we don't. In our self-righteousness, sometimes we don't reveal our own brokenness. We, we hide our own weaknesses. We hide our own brokenness be, behind a facade of self-confidence and false strength. Have you ever looked at, at uh, some of the old spaghetti westerns? Remember all those you know, the westerns, and you would see the, the town that the, that the cowboys would ride through, right? Looked like a great town. What was it? A bunch of sets that just had the front of the buildings, and there was nothing behind it. Sometimes people call Christians hypocrites because we put up a great false front. Like nothing's wrong here, and we all know there is. We all know there is. Years ago, Carla and I lived in a relatively affluent area, and there were people who were building and buying some of the just monstrous homes. And and I really I thought, wow, that's really something, until I began to visit in some of those homes as their pastor, and I realized that half the rooms were empty. They had a huge house. They couldn't afford to put furniture in it. You see, we are, live a life that is beyond the false front. The outside of the home looked great, but inside it was empty. Look what the Apostle Paul said. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in what? Weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake... I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul says, I will rejoice in my weaknesses. 
for you and I to truly understand the amazing, incredible power and peace that comes from the forgiveness of God, we have to recognize our own sin and admit it and repent. That's one problem. The other problem is we don't really believe we can be forgiven. There are some people who think they've gone too far. They've done too much for too long. They've sinned too badly. I've had people say, Pastor, you don't know the abuse that I did. You don't know the problems that I caused. You don't know how I hurt my parents, my wife, my kids. How could God ever forgive me? You see, God not only forgives, but often he puts those who are forgiven into ministry. You read the Bible, you'll find Abraham. He started out worshiping idols. He had lots of problems with lying. Do you remember that? But yet we call him the father of our faith. Or how about Moses? He was a murderer, yet he was the one who led the children out of Egypt. Remember? Or this guy named David. David who was called a man after God's own heart. Do you remember his life story? Here's David who was an adulterer and a murderer. He saw this woman taking a bath on a rooftop and, and told a servant to go get her and bring her there. And they, and they had relationships. And then he learned that it was Uriah, one of his friends. So he sent Uriah to the front lines so that he would die so that David could marry Bathsheba, who was pregnant with his child. Do you think the afternoon soaps have it? Or John Mark, he was a coward. He left the missionary trip because he was either homesick or afraid. Or the Apostle Paul, who started out as Saul, who was persecuting Christians, who, who, who stood by while Christians were killed, yet he became an apostle and a witness to the Gentiles and wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else. Now that's hard for us to understand because for some of us, we are so used to the guilt that it's sort of like our favorite teddy bear, and we cuddle it and we hang on to it, but that guilt has fangs. You've not gone too far. You've not sinned too much. God still stands ready to forgive. And it takes our faith to step away from guilt and into grace. See, for some people, guilt is what's been running them all their life. They use every trick in the book to hide from it. They try minimizing it and rationalizing it, but inside it is gnawing them apart. Look at this, Psalm 32. I finally admitted all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide them. I said to myself, I will confess them to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is what? If you are a believer and you have confessed and you have repented of a sin and you still feel guilty for it, that guilt did not come from God. That's a devil trying to throw it back into your pathway. All my guilt is gone. You see, some of you need to deal with the first part of the problem and you need to repent of your sin. And then some of you need to recognize the second problem, that as you, reset, as you have repented of your sin, that God stands ready and is, wants to forgive you that sin, that all your guilt is gone. And, and sometimes it takes years for us to get from the first part to the second and to receive the grace. You see, we don't deserve it, but it is there for us. He is faithful and just. And the way that we understand that is to draw God close. You can't understand the grace and the love of God by holding him at arm's length. You can't hold on to him and, and to recognize the grace that we have received through forgiveness by, by merely a superficial relationship with him. You have to come close. Hebrews 10 says, let us come near to God with a sincere heart and a sure faith because we have been made free from a guilty conscience. That's what God wants for you as we relish the forgiveness that he gives us. You see, once you and I have accepted the gift of grace that's called forgiveness in Jesus' name, we can draw close to him and we can feel better and better. And it frees you then to be the people 
that God wants all of us to be. We have a tendency when we do something wrong to run away from God and hide, right? Like Adam and Eve, we, uh, you know, we get our fig leaves, and instead of reveling in the love of God, we hide it through our fig leaves of self-righteousness and rationalization. But you know, if you and I truly understood forgiveness, if we truly understood the incredible grace of God, when we sin, we would not run away from him. We would what? We would run to him. That's the God that we serve. The psalmist writes this. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Cleanse me with hyssop that I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquity. Created me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Rejoy restore to me the joy of of your salvation. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, God, you will not despise. Let's pray. Lord God, you have been faithful when we have been faithless. When we were dead in our trespasses and our sins, you did not forsake us. You, you came to us. And so, God, we know that we have broken your law, and we know that rightfully we should be condemned. We know we've rejected your love, and we thought that we knew better. But, God, we're so grateful that you are a God who forgives we're so grateful that you offer that to us in Jesus and that by, by coming to you and receiving that forgiveness, we can walk in freedom of grace. Help us to understand that this day, Father. For those who have never really received that, give them your power and strength to repent and turn away and get back on the right track with you. And then, God, help us to forgive those who have wronged us. We know in our own strength we cannot. So by your spirit, Lord, would you please come to us and fill us with more of your grace so that we can offer the grace that we have received. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.